Heine, and I'm the interim dean of the College of Agricultural and Environmental Sciences. And it's my great pleasure and honor to welcome you all to this special lecture provided by Dr. Jack Angelman, founder and president of Esri. Uh, I have a few remarks, and I'll try and keep them short. As an administrator and member of UCD faculty, I have a fairly broad perspective on the intellectual talent here on campus, and it's actually quite invigorating to look out here and see not only established faculty members, but all the early career individuals interested in the topic of today. My faculty colleagues are remarkable, our students never cease to amaze me, and our staff are the best. In that context, I'm thrilled to introduce our guest to you as being the rare individual that has the ability, the energy, and the will to push us in our thinking. And Jack Dangerman is such an individual, and we very much appreciate the time spent today. It's been very generous getting to know uh, three, only three of our campus programs that rely on spatial analysis currently, and that acknowledge its critical importance for our future. A landscape architect by training, Jack founded Environmental Systems Research Institute in 1969 with a vision that technology could be applied to help create a sustainable future. Under, under his leadership, that vision has continued to guide Esri in cutting edge GIS and geo design technologies that are now used in a wide variety of industries to help decision makers understand the data they need for impact. Jack fostered the growth of this group from a small research organization to one recognized as the world leader in GIS software development. His company employs 2,700 people in the U.S. and many who shared his passion in the beginning are still there to date, which is really a testimony to his vision and his inclusion. Um, as Dr. Jane Dangerman once said, a map is worth a million words. And he reminded us today of the importance of talking to each other. Um, and again, we, we met with him and tried to illustrate to him our Arboretum program, um, our Agricultural Sustainability program, and our Information Center for the Environment. Um, and I just can't say, he just was remarkable in not only, um, well, in listening to us, Deep, deep listener, that was evident, and um, pushing us and asking us questions about ourselves that I think that we all um, are going to take very much to heart, and we're very grateful for that. Uh, I hope that you will um, be provoked during his uh, lecture, uh, but that you will hold your comments and your questions to the end, and I would ask since it's such a large room and it echoes that you'll just be reminded that there's a microphone in the center, and if you would like to ask questions, following his lecture that you would line up right there rather than just raising your hands and speaking out. We encourage you to do that. But for now, please uh, help me in welcoming um, Jack to the podium. Uh, thank you. Welcome. I see a lot of old friends in the audience, and that's always difficult to talk for me with old friends especially this guy right down here, Robin. Uh, but anyway, welcome, and thank you very much for coming. I had a, just a thrilling day so far. It's been uh, like coming home in a way. I was grown, grow, grew up in a nursery, so I know horticulture, and my family was sort of farmers and sort of nursery people, so I got that pretty clearly. The science side came later in my life, but I, I was thrilled by that uh, introduction and reintroduction. I'm going to talk about GIS as a platform, and this is a new idea for me. It's a new idea for my colleagues, but before I do that, I want to introduce Damien Spangroves. Damien, could you stand up? He's a pretty cool guy. <laughs> and, um, in the spirit of what Mary was saying, it's, what I notice it's, is that you are a real community. Do you guys know each other in the room? All of you? Do you, do you know everybody in the room? Really? Do you? Okay, meet one new person right now for me, please. That's turn around, get up, meet someone new right now.
Okay. Okay, that's good. <laughs> that's enough of that. <laughs> good, thank you. Perfect. Good. Thank you. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> Well, geography is all about multidisciplinary mixing, as, as some of you know, and uh, that's really been my whole career. Relationships are very important in my field, and, well, friendships are most important. That's sort of the bottom line for me. So as we navigate through this discussion, I want you to keep that in mind, because it's, it's one of the dimensions that we often forget about in the academy and in government and in business that this, there's this other overlay of how we're connected um, and it's pretty powerful. Let's start with this. You and I are living in a challenging world, a world that's changing. With all of these words, they invoke for us memories or thoughts or concepts of, of a very challenging situation and for the rest of your life and the rest of my life, um, we're going to be facing the kind of intermixing of this stuff. And it's sort of my opinion has been my opinion for maybe 50 years that we need a kind of new way of understanding the planet. And that's what got me excited when I first saw what GIS could deliver. And it still excites me to death right now that we can actually do something with the science and the, and, and the measurements that we are building. So we can also start with this notion that geography is a platform. It's a platform for understanding our world. It's a science platform. And GIS has made it come alive. In the digital age, it's kind of how it really emerged. Maps help us both see and understand very quickly but they also help us integrate our knowledge one discipline to another. This is part of the reason why it's so powerful. Geography, if we, if we go back a few centuries, was all about understanding, but the way we got that understanding is we'd be explorers and we came back and we wrote them up and wrote it up what our real experiences were and that was very cool. Kind of qualitative dimensions of geography and the National Geographic Society was characterized as the document system that would give us that knowledge. Uh, when I was a student starting off, these were some of my professors. They were very funny, unusual, and interesting characters. They were also exploring, but they were exploring the dimensions of computerizing maps and making up something that I like to call computational geography. It's the melding of computers and maps and spatial analytics. And they did it just for the hell of it. <laughs> they had fun with it. They were sort of exploring, much like explorers did in geographic space in the, in the old days. And it was on this foundation, some theories, some new methods, some new tools, that GIS was really birth, uh, birthed. And today, there are millions of users of this macroscope. It's like a microscope, but allowing us to see context as well as content. And it's, it's, it's about to grow, I think, uh, several orders of magnitude bigger. Why? Well, these are sort of what I've made up as uh, the reasons. You'll have your own reasons, but maps communicate. They communicate stories. They communicate our experiences. They communicate quickly across different cultures, across different languages. And the second thing is that this integrative power of GIS where you can bring different sets together and, and compare and do relationship, it's very powerful, spatial analytics. And a third one is analytics themselves are, are, are growing, understanding patterns and relationships and processes and models in spatial terms is not just analytics, it's spatial analytics. And third, there, fourth, there is a new field starting to come out called geodesign. I like this field. It's the blending of science with design. 
So uh, I'd like to ask the question, how many of you are designers in this room? Seven, 18. 18. I disagree. Who put your little outfit together this morning? <laughs> you know, you stood in the mirror. <laughs> you kind of designed that, or, you know, designing your friendships, or designing your life pattern, or designing how you got here to this room. Or de design is innate in all of us, just like spatial thinking is. And this, I like to bring that out because I think we're just at an age where we're starting to get conscious that we can actually take on the future, you know, design a better world, design a better way it's going to turn out. And the linking between science and this notion of design is, is I think, one of the reasons why people are saying, oh my god, this is really cool. Design's big these days, right? It's really cool. You wear a black shirt, you're a designer, and really good. Uh, and the linking of science to that, uh, bringing understanding combined with science, is, it's, a neat, it's a neat thing. And finally, the technology is shifting, and I'll talk quite a bit about that. Um, I mean, I've gone through 50 years of shifts. This is the biggest shift that I've ever seen. So let's start with maps communicate. These are a few little stories. The map in the center is Fukushima's radiation plume. Some of you have seen this. It's been published. You can see where the radiation went. Went in about 15, 20 kilometers. And plummeted down on the people and the food that was there. But the Japanese government evacuated only about four kilometers around the plant. Get the story? And the map was kept a secret for three months. That's another little interesting story. When it came out, then the prime minister lost his job. The map a little bit to the left is the tsunami. And uh, it shows the hour by hour forecast of when the tsunami would hit. And by the way, this map saved lots of lives. It was really wonderful. Hawaii evacuated the tsunami zones, and it was very good. The map in the lower right shows a model showing conservation for open space land hotspots in South Africa. And that's how they designed some of their backbone national park system. And above it is where all the money is going this year for the World Bank. Notice Greece, Cyprus big circles. You get the stories really quickly. You notice what I'm talking about? Maps tell stories. And above it is where Walmart is going to locate you know, a great store. And they're doing it rationally using all the s demographic data and traffic data and uh, also climate change. It's, it's supposed to be animated here, but it didn't can show change. And we can all come to understand things. So you've understood. One, two, five quick stories in just a couple seconds, actually. This is the power of why people are so attracted to it. Second, GIS is about integration. And we know this, I guess. Anybody that's touched this field know this, but it's useful just to revisit it. We can take data from different sources and overlay it and integrate it. We can synthesize it. This second has the effect of bringing different disciplines or cultures together around common place. So if we look here at the university, we, you know, everything is stovepiped into ologies, geology, sociology. Is there an agroology? I'm sorry, no, there's <laughs> something like that. But agroecology. Oh, agroecology, that's right, ecology. I mean, we do get specialized. This is part of what we do. We got this from the Germans in the 1800s, or 18th century, rather. And that made science go further. And we also do it inside of government agencies and university faculties. And we organize ourselves into these specialties. And that's what's life. And until you get about 50 years old in the university setting, you don't start doing cross-cutting work. Now, that's a change. It's a little different here, I know, in Davis. But generally speaking, that's the academy. And it's also government. It's also business. But what GIS is facilitating is cross-cutting crosswalks by facilitating a common language. And that common language means we can do better collaboration and communication about here or there. We can bring our ologies together into holistic approaches to problem solving. I love that idea. So that's what attracted me in the very beginning. It just uh, it still attracts me a lot.
today. Third, spatial analytics, and there are hundreds of these tools, these are just a few of them, allow us to look at space-time relationships, spatial autocorrelation, exploratory regression analysis, hunting for unlocking the secrets of how things work. Here's a field here and here's a field there. What's the interrelationship between them in space and time? Bugs moving around, or people, or water. We live in a dynamic space-time world. Spatial analytics allow us to create understanding of these things, like in a computational environment. So when those old geographers went out, they would observe things. They wrote neat papers. They took photos. That was geography and its related sciences for hundreds of years. We're now moving into the digital age, and we can exploit, do analytics, large analytics, large-scale modeling, and uh, create new understanding. And I've already talked about geodesign, but the graphics here is simply meant to express layered information measurements integrated into a design framework coming out with alternative, alternative plans. Do we put the train here or there? Do we put the city growth here or there? Do we put the housing here or there? Do we put the farming here or there? Will we plant this here or there? All of that stuff, um, we do it mentally. You, you guys are all designers. You, you do do spatial design, but often without the science. So one of the, the fields that most excites me is this linking of science with the design field. And I'll show you a couple examples of that later. I want to especially point out that geodesign is not just for designers. It involves you know, collecting, remote sensing, measurement, and then analytics, and then action. So uh, one of my good friends, Saul Werman, often says understanding precedes action. So we do geoanalytics prior to action. Or sometimes we don't, right? I mean, sometimes we don't. <laughs> we look like damn fools. We get up in front of people and we pretend like we've got the right solution, but we don't have the backup. All of us have been in that situation. So this linking together of these two worlds uh, explicitly is, is a lot of fun. Finally, new technology is extending, that's the word I'll use here, later I'll say transforming GIS into a platform. We've got a few million desktop users, we have a few hundred thousand servers serving data on the web, we have organizations that link their different servers together, we might call these enterprise federated systems. But the advent of devices, how many of you have a smartphone? Okay, almost everybody. Um, you know, tablet environments, devices with apps um, and cloud is changing everything. But more, more about that in a few minutes. So historically, we've seen, and some of this is actually your work, GIS be successful in thousands and thousands and thousands of applications and organizations. These are just a list of a few of them. But I thought I would spend five minutes showing you this year's a few users sharing maps with me to give you some context of what's going on uh, right now. These are a few users who are advancing geographic science with better measurement, point clouds, LIDAR, studying the deformation of the planet, um, et cetera. They're doing science. Some people are doing agriculture, globally, locally, tracking pests, what's happening. Some people are monitoring environmental change. Last week I was in um, the Horn of Africa. This is 10 years, month by month, drought change there. Managing natural resources, water, forests, ecosystems, carbon accounting. We're not only learning how to measure, but we're learning how to apply it and do geo-accounting of what really matters. Sorry. Some people are planning for the future. They're doing urban design, 
and regional planning and agricultural planning and planning for the Hajj in Saudi to Mecca, all kinds of planning, conservation planning. It's a discipline and they're using spatial as the language. Others are simply managing records, like important records such as the land ownership of parcels, who owns what. This is the foundation of our society. It's one of the reasons why America is so uh, advanced. It's asserted by the World Bank is that we have strong land record information systems as opposed to developing countries that don't. We tax, we have rule of law implementation of ownership. We have all these incredible things. A huge investment, but GIS is the framework to do it in. And others manage utilities like PG&E here um, or Edison or all around the world, water utilities, gas utilities, these invisible networks under the ground or above the ground are now being transactionally maintained in this digital setting. And others are managing transportation systems, roads, monitoring traffic, ship traffic, air, airports, air traffic, railroads, all of it. And others are developing renewable and non-renewable energy using it. So one of the things I want you to start to get conscious about is people are doing a heck of a lot of stuff all over the planet. These little postage stamps of work, sometimes big postage stamps, sometimes little, and they're all transactionally doing it. Hundreds and hundreds of thousands of individuals are doing it. And it's getting smaller in scale. <laughs> they're moving right into buildings and managing rooms and allocating hospital beds to rooms and moving faculty around, and classrooms around and rooms and campuses and, and like that, using exactly the same GIS technology in 3D. And others are at a different scale of things just looking at changing demographics, the census, statistical data, <laughs> and considering the changes that are occurring in the world we seem to be getting more emergencies, natural resource emergencies, but also cultural ones, severe weather, flooding, earthquakes. Um, and another dimension of our world is human health, and it's evolving along different diseases that are being monitored, managed, finding the best place for new hospitals, how do we bring about better policy for, for Medicaid, these are all spatial problems. And uh, then there's those who uh, are, are trying to keep the homeland secure and putting up defense. So GIS is usually used, I mean, the, the presidential report, you know, the 7.30 in the morning daily brief, he finds out what's going on in Syria using GIS. And Intel people are tracking bad guys. And um, this is happening in all countries all over the world. And then there's business. Business is trying to get the geographic advantage. I was saying to a few people yesterday, I was at Starbucks on Wednesday this week, and I mean, they're just unbelievable. I just had a Starbucks, which made me feel good, you know, <laughs> supporting my customers. But <laughs> anyway, but no, they, they are locating stores. They're understanding the patterns of why people go to their stores. This is a big geographic modeling thing. and. Most of the Fortune 1000 businesses are managing supply chain, driving efficiency in the way that they do things, and creating better services as a result of it. So I love this, that, that things are getting more efficient throughout the economic sector. And then people are getting more engaged government to citizen using maps. Where are we spending money? Where should we spend money? What are your ideas? Crowdsourcing, citizen science, um, reporting the, the earthquake, reporting the earthquake in China, is it reporting what's going on you know, in, uh, in Cairo right now with Twitter maps. So exposing citizens to citizens, but also exposing government policies to citizens. And, and vice versa. This is, this is a new medium for us. So all these little individual things 
Lots of governments are starting to stand up what they're calling infrastructure. These are a few examples. China has, in the upper right here, has uh, a major national system. Those little green things over here, those are each of the different ministries. Uh, transactionally updating geology, land, etc. And then the data is all replicated into the National Planning Bureau for national planning, the five-year plan. And uh, Indonesia, and India is just starting actually, hopefully this year, with a massive system. And cities like Bogota or Geneva, they integrate all their different departments in a GIS, so they're leveraging the leveraging the knowledge that one agency has within another. So I, I think this is an interesting time for this field because it's, it's evolving along. I would say, especially in the technology dimension, we're at a major turning point. And that's the framework that I want to talk about today. GIS is transforming into a platform. So we've heard of this term platform before. Facebook is a platform. Search, Google is a platform. I mean, they used to talk about Microsoft as a platform, but maybe it's not anymore. Maybe it is. I don't know. It's really a platform which is extendable and open and interoperable with all kinds of other things. The web is a platform. People think of government as a platform. If it just opened up, it might be. But the data is still too locked down. GIS is turning into a platform, and these first 50 years mark different stages of the enabling hardware and software tools that allowed it to come into being. Mainframe, seven hours to run a job, junk, <laughs> mini computers, personalized scientific computing, desktop computing, client server computing, web services, serving a map on the web. Even some of it was done for the first time here in the world. Now, now we're moving into a different stage. And the stage is very similar to, to music, actually. You know how um, Steve Jobs transformed the whole music industry. With iMusic and devices, you don't buy the record anymore. You, you know, <laughs> there's no RCA. There's no Sony DVD. No, music is live and linked and available anytime, anywhere, any place on any device. Well, Steve's was only on this device, but it's starting to open up so that you can have it on any device. The cloud device pattern is here, and that, that really is a platform where we take the traditional GIS of desktops and servers and we connect them to a cloud. And we register services. And those services are available by any device. In this case, it's an open cloud where you can connect any service and access it from any device. You follow me on this? Um, or, in other words, mapping and GIS analytics, the data streams, become a service like a dial tone. So like music is a dial tone, <laughs> I'm listening. And if we put it in context of GIS being the understanding language, GIS becoming the integrative language, I'm really building a case here that we can have a global spinning living atlas available anywhere, anytime, by anyone, and I can connect in. And as the little cartoons show, the GIS professionals connect into it. They register their services. Other people can discover it and find it and use it and consume it, mash it up. So the idea is federated everywhere, mash up as the integration device, and then everybody gets involved. So one of our users, Shell Oil, had about 3,000, no, sorry, about 300 professional people get the keyboards every day doing exploration work and so on. And they introduced this pattern and they now have about 10,000 users because everybody was able to start accessing it. Executives are accessing it, using, making maps, spatializing their data. It's just like within six months, everything changed. So that's the kind of 
amplification, I think is the right word, of geographic knowledge that I want to see. And it's early days. It's like nine months old, this notion. So imagine that we see the same hockey stick growth of geographic knowledge, the full science base, into everything. Here we're not talking about just Google Maps flying around like Superman or something. I'm talking about the full stack of knowledge into the way that we design our stuff, our footprints, our life, um, like that. So this platform notion is leveraging many other trends. Yes, GIS is becoming more powerful. It's becoming 3D. It's becoming real time. It's becoming easier to use. All of those cool things. But it's also co-evolving with more measurement. We're measuring everything that moves. And also, this is resulting in lots more data, big data. I mean, GIS data is pretty big in the first place, but real-time big data, spatially referenced, this is, this, is, uh, gonna, this, is, this is gonna be really exciting. And computing platforms, moving to the cloud, apps, the app cloud connection, that's showing up on our screen. And that's, all of that's co-evolving with science itself. So we're seeing more collaborative science, like I saw all day here today. Whoa, thrilled me, working across disciplines. And um, big science, big data. Um, yeah. This platform also enables pervasive access. So I, just like at Shell Oil, I connect the GIS geeks with, through the cloud, with everybody else through pervasive devices. Suddenly I'm panning and zooming on things I can actually relate with. And the user experience changes. This is the dashboard for this. It's the mayor of Boston. It's showing real-time crime. So he just walks along, his little, <laughs> checks it out. How's it going? Ah, I got a bomb on my hand. Real-time, everything changed. He knew a m moment later, or maybe he waited a while before he opened up, but that's a different kind of experience about geography. It's wiring up the world, real-time streaming, and a different kind of user experience that I can pan and zoom in 2D and 3D. That's where we're moving, is a living, spinning world that's measured, organized, accessible, and available. This kind of platform integrates all kinds of geospatial data, traditionally maps and uh, data sets, but also imagery and increasingly drones and real-time imagery that we're seeing in the military. It also integrates in social media, so I can open this up and see once what they're saying around here. Hope none of you are tweeting, I'll just check it out. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh, so, tweets, Facebook, citizen contributed geospatially referenced measurements, and sensor networks. Real-time sensors out on those fields, Tom, that we were in, can give me kind of a real-time picture. More about that later. What makes this thing work? Is it just some bloody cloud computer and some, uh, no. A new idea has been emerging called a web map. A web map is not actually data, it's a visualization of the data in the web with pointers back to the real data sets. So if you see this diagram, there are some distributed or federated servers, map service, image server, modeling services, data services, and they're expressed as a little web map like these things over on the right. And I can interact with those web maps. I can do the kind of pan and zoom on them, up and down scale. But I can also query them, what's, what's here? And it tells me what's here. But that's actually pointing back to the raw data, which might be a sensor network, or might be a transactional database that's being updated in real time, like traffic or, um, or, or tax records. I can also edit my, I can edit my web map, which is a view, of course. I can edit my web map, which is a view, 
back to the raw data. I'm not really editing the web map, I'm editing the data. But my view into it is through this simple little funny thing called a web map. And also I can run analytics on this. I can overlay, the, I can mash them up, I can actually run spatial analytics on this stuff. And I'll show you an example of that in a minute. This notion is a new notion. It's maps which are live and linked back to databases. And this diagram kind of shows how it's transforming organizations. Here's a bunch of university departments. No, I didn't mean that. It could be a number of different departments in a city or different departments in a um, federal agency or different departments in Starbucks businesses. They each share a web map into a virtual space, a cloud, with pointing back to their original data, live and linked. They're not actually sharing their data, they're sharing a view of the data. The interesting thing about this is that it's easy to work with that little web map, and it works on any device. Let's just back this up. By the way, a web map can be looked at by, from any device. I don't have to have a device, any device. A little web map can be embedded into my website. So I open up my website, huh, I open up the map, and I'm pan and zooming on my web map. It's actually accessing these raw data sets. You get this idea? This is a really important concept. Once you get the concept, it's very cool. So when I put it into a cloud like this with an index, I can actually see each of the different departments or subject areas or measurements. A web map could be weather, a web map could be traffic, a web map could be a static soil map. But I can interrelate these web maps, mash them up, connect them, in, interact with them, and I have a GIS in the web, in a cloud. Now, I've drawn this picture probably 10 different ways over my life. The last succession was you put it all into a big database can and then everybody can use each other's data. But what does that require? It means taking everybody's individual data, coming up with a common data model. And for that we need to have agreement. <laughs> we have to be friends. We have to normalize the databases. Oh my God, that takes days, weeks, months, years. It usually doesn't get done because you have to share your raw data. So that is, that really was the architecture of the 80s and the 90s and even more recently. Before that, you had to buy a mainframe computer and you put all your data in the mainframe computer. That was enterprise integration. And then came the DBMS. This is the third step in a way. It's live linked, uh, live linked relationships back to core distributed data sets, federated everywhere and mash up, mash upable. That's another generation of IT. And this environment is very agile. I can share and you can use my data and still be update my data in a distributed environment. This is almost transformational. That's why I say GIS is about ready to flip out. And there are thousands of organizations who got it even in this first nine months, like the UN Environmental Program or the World Bank or most of our federal agencies now are starting to get this pattern and starting to implement it. And a lot of cities and states. And the pattern is simple. I can set up a portal, share my web maps in a common environment, and the web maps that I share, I choose to share in the common environment. They don't have to be all of them but the ones that I choose to share can be used by somebody else as if, it's their, as if it's their map. So this vision that some people have had about a spatial data infrastructure, like let's say the state of California gets all of its agencies to work together. You know that's difficult, right? <laughs> impossible, except this way it's not impossible. We simply share access to it and we can mash it up and integrate it without pain, institutional pain. And these web maps have lots of intriguing characteristics. For example, I can publish the web map from this database. I can mash it up. But I can also embed the web map in what, what's called a story map. And uh, I invite you to check this out, uh, uh, storymaps.com. 
I think is the address, isn't that, Damien? Story maps. We publish one of these about every week, and we publish the story map, and it's everything from the sinking of the Titanic to civil wars to uh, walks down the Washington, D.C. Mall to uh, visits to Palm Springs to what's happening in Syria. There's text, there's multimedia, there's photographs, and there's a map, and it's all interactive. And so check it out, it's really fun. But I'm getting ahead of myself. These story maps can be put into story books, so this is, this is definitely ahead of myself. So, uh, but it's the coolest thing that I have to share today. I can, everybody see that? <laughs> I can basically, hopefully, turn the pages on a story map. And those maps, I can link, and it brings up the live linked map which is, as you now know, uh, spinning live linked back to the core databases. What's happening with health right now? What's happening with, this is how, that's how the uh, mayor of Boston has this thing. And my sense is that we will see a different kind of an iBook, ebook, um, <laughs> emerge, <laughs> iBooks and ebooks, right? Uh, they, they will be live linked back to core data. And this has huge implications for curriculum and learning, project-based or experiential-based learning. I have a book curriculum back to live linked server-based services. And uh, I like that whole idea. This is one that I can't actually run because I'm not able to hook up the, the uh, the internet here, but the, the point here is we've been just working with the Dartmouth uh, people on their health atlas showing where there's, where there's uh, more money being spent on Medicaid and less money being spent on Medi Medicaid. And if I could open this book, I could take you through a quick story just like those maps I shared before. I could show you something that was most dramatic, which is why we're spending so much money on Medicaid in certain geographies. It's so an explanatory spatial analysis. You know, it's, and the implications here, Tom, to, for agriculture are enormous because I just publish books that tell the story. I put it up, I email you my book, it's my story. The implications here are profound. These are just a few examples of these story maps and I really invite you to look at them because they're, they're fun. You can tell your own story in about 15 minutes, just throw the data away, take the template, pour your own data in and tell your story. So today we're talking about doing this for the gardens. What's blooming this weekend? I link it to some photographs or, or how's the heat this summer? How's the drought going in, in southern Europe or in the valley here? I want to link it up and tell a story. Talk to, these story maps are kind of the ultimate user interface for GIS. So instead of having to learn all the buttons and stuff, I don't want to do that. I just want to look at what's going on. That requires somebody to be clever enough to tell a story. You know, great storytellers are so fun to listen to. They're rare. Great geographic storytellers, well, there was a lot of them at the National Geographic, the story about this or the story about that. And we know them. We know those kind of stories. This is a birthing of a new kind of medium, which is a storytelling medium where you design and tell a story through maps. And I think that'll be wonderful, actually. Should it go on the east side or the west side, right? Should it go right down the middle? And why? And what does it look like? Okay. I'm gonna talk now about the more technical side of this, which is the architecture of this kind of platform. Anybody interested in that or I could? Okay. Uh, traditionally, GIS has been desktops and servers. At least that's been the model lately. Uh, the cloud fits in as an infrastructure component. So we have servers and cloud. It's kind of the back office part of GIS. It's where we do the data management, clerical work, transaction management, et cetera. The front office has been the desktop in the past, but it's pretty difficult to use compared to devices and what people want is simple, you know, 
no time. So the desktop is continuing to be the foundation for the GIS professional for creation, authoring, analytics, thousands of things that we do. But now it's connected into services. It's fed by services. And you can upload data and create services out of it, dial tone, and then use those services in the desktop, but also use them in these other device environments. This is the architecture plus content. So there's apps and applications, there's back office infrastructure, and there's content, the spinning living planet. And this can be applicable to the whole world or it can be applicable just to a little organization like, like the university. So if we said, let's build an enterprise system for the university, we'd have maybe some in the cloud, some servers stood up. We'd load content which was reusable year after year, like those 19 years of the, uh, you know, the field plots, PhD theses that are done with geographic data, get implemented in the cloud and people can reuse it, discover it, reuse it, etc. in any kind of other device. So we don't often think about the university as an enterprise, but it is, of course, and it has year after year longevity in both research and teaching. If we brought together just the data that is collected and measured, just like you guys are a little community of friends, let's reinforce that friendship network by building at least web maps that let us use each other's and le leverage each other's data sets across organizations as well as the huge amount from external sources. Content and especially base content is very important for this and so my colleagues and I have been investing in building a series of global base maps. You know, topographic base maps, street base maps, we bought all of the digital globe imagery for the planet, we're standing that up in the cloud, um, hydrologic base maps, and demographic base maps. What the hell is a demographic base map? Demographics is, yeah, for some people, demographics is a base map. Other people, topography is a base map. So our thought here is to stand up base foundational information spinning in the cloud where you put operational data, transaction data, your data onto these bases and you can mix it up. And, uh, the problem with GIS has always been <laughs> you spend about 90% of the money collecting the data and getting it all together, right? Especially the base information. It's expensive, it's difficult to do. So we're trying to transform that to put it as dial tone. So when you open up a desktop or you open a one of these, you got that base up there spinning seven by 24 and then you bring your own data onto it. And it's starting to work actually. And how do you access that? Well, through desktops, and as I mentioned, spatial analytics is getting better. These are, this is a big frontier for us. Also, 3D is becoming better. Not simply 3D visualization, but 3D design. So I'll come back to this when we talk about geo design. I not only want to see things in 3D, I want to analyze things in 3D, and I want to create things in 3D. <laughs> Think of it like a 3D editor. And uh, also building and managing workflows to do, you don't do much of this in the university, but your colleagues in government and in business do. They stand up factories for data compilation and editing and being able to streamline that is, is a big effort. And then how do we make maps as good as what the master cartographer could do? And there's tricks at this when we talk about database-driven cartography, we keep advancing the method here. It's, it's getting pretty close to, to being acceptable. <laughs> Damien is a cartographer, and so we always are joking about this. Look, desktop now, in uh, GIS terms, includes image processing. In the past, we had image processing tools, and we had GIS tools. They've now folded together, so we can blend them together. We can do things like mosaicing and 3D measurement and automatic alignment of images. We don't have to be a specialist in this field or that field anymore. Um, and being able to bring in this rich trough of data called LIDAR and just start visualizing it and analyzing it, that's very cool. 
I fly my fields. I know top of corn, bottom, and I, I can just use it. That's powerful. After desktop, what happens? There's web apps. What are web apps like? They're very thin, downloadable, free, open sourced, configurable for mapping and looking at mapping through time or querying. I've been talking about what's a map versus an app. <laughs> the line's getting a little thin here. But these are apps that allow us to put maps and interact with them, make cool maps, mash up maps, query apps, edit apps. And these now are transforming into web scenes, not just web maps. So I spent a lot of time on what is a web map. With WebGL, there's a new thing on the street called web scene, which is a 3D document that I can blast out without sharing the data. So citizens in Davis all could be sent a proposed uh, 3D building proposal and they can just play around with it in their browser. Isn't that cool? Uh, so I don't need any software, I don't need any data. I just spin around and that's going to be transformational. The last thing that we're working on particularly is server-based, cloud-based analytics. That's really being able to combine these web maps and their data sets behind them to do classic spatial analysis but from a cloud environment. And I, I think what I'd like to do rather than talk about this is just show you a very quick um, thing that we're doing. Here in the US, we took all of the digital data sets for landscape data and organize them in the cloud. This is soils, geology, vegetation, landform, land cover, uh, and so on. Um, about 30 physical layers and 300 characteristics. And also all the cultural geographic features for the whole country. This is 7,000 layers of information, health information, demographic information, lifestyle information, whether you voted, whether you sent a letter to your congress, all this stuff, uh, down to little small geographies. Stood them up in the cloud, and then instead of having to have software, I can actually interact through a browser and play around with this stuff. So you want to look at this a minute? You get this idea. This is what's, I think this, is, this will give you a clue to what's possible. And this will start off kind of slow and geeky, but then towards the end, it won't be. This is I need yeah. to have Suzanne Foss, which is unbelievable. In she is, too. Explaining, this, uh, explaining what this uh, system will be. So, Suzanne, wel welcome her. She's, she's great. Thanks, Jack. We'd like to show you some really amazing landscape services that are coming online in just a few months. Beginning in April, organizational subscribers to ArcGIS Online will be able to search and discover the Esri Landscape Analysis Group which is a collection of over 30 physical, hydrological, and ecological layers. When we say landscape, we mean a myriad of data sets that describe the land and the environments in which we live. So this includes things like the physical structure of the land, land cover, land classes, soil characteristics like crop production, subsidence, depth to bedrock, but also geology and ecosystems. Landscape also means the economic, and man-made features that influence how we use the land. So coal basins, oil shale, and infrastructure like pipelines and transmission. Finally, landscape also means information on the agencies that manage the land. So our various cultural and protected areas like parks, forests, and historic sites. All this content is ready to use for both mapping and analysis. Instead of cache tile services, we're providing each of these layers as a feature service and as an image service, so you have options for how you use it. Let's go ahead and take a closer look at one of these maps. In this case, I'm opening up the Federal Lands Service from the Protected Areas Database of the United States. This service allows me to visualize all of our protected areas. Because it's a feature service, I can control the look and the feel of this map. 
I can change the symbols to a different color. Maybe I want to take a look at green to have them contrast with my base map. Because it's not a cache tile service, I also have access to all of the detailed source information behind these maps. So I could break out my symbols by attributes, maybe the description of the protected area, maybe the area's name, and then I can differentiate between them more easily. Let's keep going and add some other landscape layers to this map. I'm going to search for all of the layers in the Esri Landscape Analysis Group, and this gives me a really easy way to explore and mash up these different resources. For example, here I see NHD plus surface water. This data set includes all of the lakes, the rivers, the accumulated flow areas across the entire United States. It's an incredibly extensive data set. I may also want to overlay this with flood risk. Here I have the 100-year flood zones from the FEMA database. In this way, I can quickly and easily paint the landscape with all of the different data sets that describe our country. Because these aren't cached tile services, I can also click and bring up more information about any of these features and take a look at all of those values and detailed, detailed pop-ups. So this shows you just a couple ways you can easily find this information and use it in ArcGIS Online. Next, we'd like to show you how you can leverage these services for analysis. You can bring these layers into your desktop clients and use them just as if they were any other local data set. You can mash them up with your local information, maybe a shapefile. And you can also select against these features dynamically, which also means that you can export them. You can download them to your machines, and you can use them in offline workflows. Finally, you can use these services directly in geoprocessing. So here I have a simple model that calculates areas of high population growth near forests. And I can take this feature service of our national forests and drop this straight into my model, connecting it to my tools and using it directly in my analysis. You can also use these services for analysis in web clients. This is a sample web application we put together that allows you to fuse landscape image services to ask questions. In this case, let's say we're looking to find valuable undeveloped land that we could propose to put aside for conservation. What we're doing here is performing a weighted overlay using four image services, slope, elevation, aspect, and land use. We can take these different factors, and we can dynamically reweight them, emphasizing or reducing the influence of different land characteristics. And the weighted overlay is recalculated on the fly within seconds. This allows us to take a quick look at suitability across the entire United States. And as I zoom in, the analysis is refined, the image services are resampled, and the processing is repeated at the appropriate scale, meaning that I can see the true depth of information available to me in this area. The coverage of these landscape services, combined with on-the-fly processing, opens up exciting possibilities for analysis. Let's take a quick moment to show how we can use this analysis to answer a question. We'll say that I'm looking to propose areas for conservation here in southern Utah. And as you can see, there's several national forests here, but they're disconnected, which could have ramifications for wildlife and migratory patterns. I can apply geodesign principles to this problem. I can take a look at my conservation goals summarized in this weighted overlay, and I can compare and contrast that with the existing federal lands. For example, here in this area, I see a space between two forests that also looks to be suitable given our suitability parameters. So what I can do is I can zoom in, and I can sketch out an initial conservation plan over this area. I'll use some simple sketching tools, and I'll begin to trace some of the suitable land in this area according to my different factors, and make sure that I'm putting aside valuable, suitable land. What I can do next is I can refine this plan based on the geographic context. For example, what about the cultural and political context? I can zoom in and I can adjust this plan based on the existing federal land boundaries. This ensures that my area, my proposed area, is more accurate, and also as I go ahead and complete my plan, that it's properly connecting these two spaces and providing a wildlife corridor. I can also adjust this plan based on the physical environment. So I'll switch to my imagery base map. And then I can adjust my plan based on what I see in the terrain. 
So maybe I want to align the plan with this mountain ridge here. And I also notice the built environment in this particular base map. So I can adjust my plan to avoid developed areas like roads, towns. In this way, I'm fusing different landscape layers and geographic context to plan for both the built and natural environments at the same time. So this was a quick example of applying landscape analysis as well as geodesign techniques to solve a problem. Let's take a look at another application that fuses these landscape variables in a different way. This application allows us to pick and choose from different landscape variables in order to find areas we're interested in. We'll say in this case that I'm looking for areas of critical habitat for threatened and endangered animals, and I'm going to focus in in Northern California, east of McKinleyville. First, I want to select my landscape parameters. I am interested in critical habitat, so I'll go ahead and I'll select that variable to start off. And I also want to account for existing federal lands. So I'll browse my administrative variables, and I'll bring in percent of federal land. And I also want to make sure I'm avoiding areas that are heavily developed. So I'll take a look at demographic variables, and I'll bring in population density. These factors are brought back to the map for all of the watersheds that overlay this area, and then I can filter the map based on what I'm looking for specifically. One of the things I'm looking for is at least 5,000 acres of critical habitat. Let's just go ahead and reload our map here. I'm looking for 5,000 acres of critical habitat, and as you can see, this begins to clear my map of areas that don't match my parameters. I also want to make sure I'm not protecting land that's already put aside, so I'm going to go ahead and filter for less than 20% federal land. And lastly, if I'm proposing to put areas aside to, pr to protect critical habitat, I want to make sure that they're not already heavily populated, so I'll drop that variable down very low. The point is live linked real-time data in the cloud reading in the music and using it locally, either through thick clients or thin client access, merging it with my own data. This is a different age because it's going to shorten the amount of time that we have to collect our data. And add to that all the data that's being shared by users in the cloud. We now have about 700,000 maps that have been shared that people are, are using each other's data. So it isn't any longer about convincing my colleagues of whether they share their data. No, they're sharing a view of their data, and uh, it's hockey stick time. And what would that mean at the university? What would it mean across the UC system? What would it mean for California? What would it mean for, you get the NGO community, the farmer community. I don't have to be a GIS geek to weight those overlays and figure out, as we wire up the whole planet, with different kinds of measurements and make it accessible, GIS will be delivered in a new way. And part of the way it will be delivered is through apps that run on little devices, viewing apps, editing apps, query apps, field data collector apps. Uh, Damien configured one on the way up here this morning for the garden for collecting observational information on my iPad as I walk around or iPhone. This, is, this plant needs water. <laughs> Somebody else immediately sees that. Or this is a dashboard app. It actually is wired up to read in multiple services, multiple web maps, some of them being real time. What's the status of my projects? What's the status of crime in Boston? What's the status of what's going on in Syria? You get the idea. What's, what's the status of water drought? What's the status of the tillage, what's the status of crop production, what's the, whatever the measurement is, we can take real-time services and drop it into a dashboard and, and look at it. Now behind these apps and applications is infrastructure, and part of the infrastructure is served by servers. <coughs> it's the way that we serve up content to these apps. And part of it is cloud services. There's two distinct ones. This year, we're 
creating a real-time engine for services. And this has huge implications for us in science. Um, you can take any kind of real-time streaming measurement, um, water, vehicles moving around, flicker, process it in a term called inline processing, doing geo-triggers and geofencing, and then message it out to anything like uh, email. I'm getting close to Damien. Mm. I need a message that tells me no. In other words, in real time, I'm measuring myself relative to other objects, or I'm just measuring 10,000 observations a minute and geofiltering them in various ways. So I'll show you a very quick second video that makes this very clear. And again, this one starts off a little bit boring, but it gets very exciting at the end. This is our operations dashboard for ArcGIS. This is where we can browse to see what operation views are available. An operation view is basically a situational awareness display for a particular business problem. In this case, we see an asset monitoring operation view. If I open this up, I can see who's authored this. All this information is coming from ArcGIS Online. So somebody's previously configured this operation view. Let's go ahead and open this. And what we'll see is we've got a layout that has things that are appropriate for an asset monitoring situation. We can see that we have an assets panel, and the assets could be anything from a, a vehicle to a package to a person, whatever you consider an asset to be. We have a section here for geofences, which we'll demonstrate here in a moment. And then we have a section down here for alerts. These are going to be the anomalies or the, the situations that are occurring that we want to be uh, notified about uh, as they occur. So I'm going to start a simulation. And what we'll see in our assets box here is that we'll get some vehicles uh, that'll appear. We have two vehicles in this case. We can see that their speeds are changing and their location on the map is changing as well. Uh, so this is connecting to a vehicle out in the real world. And what we've got configured on the server is a set of services that are looking for monitoring the speed of the vehicle. So we can see the speeds are changing. And as these vehicles go on their own pass here, we can right click this guy and follow him. And as his speed exceeds 70 miles an hour, we have a rule on the server that generates alerts based on that situation. So we can see that we start an alert. It's been ongoing for a minute, now two minutes. And instead of bombarding the user with a bunch of separate alerts, we give one alert and update the status along the way. We also have a service on the GeoEvent server that's listening for panic button engagement. So in this case, we're listening for a panic button, and we can see that the panic button has now been pressed on. And this guy's pressed it three times now, so he may be in some kind of emergency state that we need to respond to. Now, if I'm a fleet manager, I may get a call from my security officer, and he may say there's a hijacking risk in a particular area that we want to monitor. So we could put this in a dangerous area category, and we can go digitize in a new geofence on the fly here. And what we'll see is if we go follow this vehicle in, as soon as he hits the uh, look inside of this dangerous area, we'll start to monitor his situation. And we can see that he's been inside this dangerous area for a few minutes now, and now he's gone outside. And as he enters the other area uh, inside this avoidance uh, situation, we can see that another alert pops in. So we can track how long they spent inside and generate a violation report at the end of the day uh, and take appropriate action with that driver or whoever may be at fault in this case. You get the idea. Uh, I'm going near a drugstore, and the drugstore CVS knows that I need a prescription because I'm down. It sends me an email and says, Jack, swing by. I'll have your prescription ready by the time you get there. Bang. Or where are your kids now, right now? Uh, so we have one user that stood this up. What's the name of the organization? We can't say. Uh, a, let's just say a big carrier that's providing this now as a service for kid tracking. Are they really where they said they are? Or are they in trouble or like that? These are just really early days, but we have hundreds of organizations that are starting to track things. And these are geo-events flagged by geo-triggers. And some of it's kind of scary, 
things, privacy. But think about um, movement of animals. Think about, um, you know, there's, there's incredible both social and physical uh, possibilities with this real-time technology. And it's not, some people think about real-time GIS as simply being the measurement side. It's also the analytic side. So I want to in real time do analytics. This is, these bad guys are getting near the Benghazi embassy. I track them from SIGINT, I move them in, messages sent out, save lives. That's kind of a weird example also, but uh, you're creative. Real time GIS is going to change things. So not only will we have services available, we'll have real time services so that everything that we measure will be available in time and space. Cloud and server infrastructure are the second leg of the back office. And they have these simple apps that are easy to make maps with. So it's no longer GIS, it's people making the maps, it's serve yourself mapping. Um, it's gonna become very popular. Um, and people can share and serve their self in mapping so they don't have to go down the hall to get a GIS. And that may be threatening to some of you, but not really because this needs to be backboned by people who actually know what they're doing. Authors of models, cartography, helping, manager of the day, all of that. This infrastructure also integrates with enterprise systems. And this is a different chapter. So a perfectly legitimate client to this cloud environment is an Excel spreadsheet. An Excel software user can now make maps with his Excel data or her Excel data using geo services off the cloud. And I can also geo enrich my spreadsheets by doing point and polygon overlay of other data out of the cloud so I can enlarge my spreadsheet. Like, what's the population density? around these dots that I've just mapped on my spreadsheet. You just bring that in as a web map from the cloud. I don't even know what GIS is, I'm just enlarging my spreadsheet. We call that geo-enrichment. So I geo-enrich my tabular databases, not only in Excel, but in SharePoint and, and uh, you know, SAP. And so suddenly we geo-enrich enterprise computing, which is a very different world than traditional GIS. Yes, GIS people build the infrastructure, but we open it up for business intelligence, for all, all of the visualization analytics that people are hungry for in corporations. And finally, this platform opens up, the hood opens up for developers, so that instead of um, GIS being the client, any client can embed maps in any client can embed geo tracking or geo proximity or geo triggers or like that. So maps for apps. Anybody can embed geo inside of their game or their logic or their you know their little app. So for the startup community, this means a whole different world. So I've been talking about um, what's happening in this field. I think it from my real experience. Um, it's at a major turning point. It's going to become a platform. That means easy, open, huge amplification of the fundamental concepts that were slowly, slowly rolled out first to the academics and then to the professional community. It'll, it'll uh, go out to many more. I don't think it's just consumers. I don't really think that's the audience. It's really all professionals, all offices. So I say the back office is opening up with a front office for all offices. This is not consumer technology, although there will certainly be a lot of amateur geographers that play around with it. But I think the intention is really to bring the music to those who really want to be spatialized. Um, and with authoritative source. Um, so. I, those of you who are looking at this as a career, some students, I think it's gonna be very strong. It's the next sort of big stage in spatializing society. But the technology isn't everything. It maybe is only 5% of the deal. 
what I saw here today, and I'm not kidding, is the kernel of collaboration and leadership as groups working together to come up with defining the infrastructure at the university level and then you know, str a struggle or a discussion about how you manage that infrastructure across different institutes and different organizations. And uh, you know, what's the data policy for the university or what's the data policy for those of you from the state or local government? What's that data policy? And then how do you plan to implement this kind of infrastructure into, this stuff is much easier to implement, but still somebody's got to be thinking through what the plan is, the knowledge transfer, teaching how to use it, thinking out what the fundamental science models and data models are behind this easy to use stuff. That doesn't go away. And uh, finally, you got to do some work, <laughs> implementation work, which is not like you're not doing it but it's a major P. And then there's the people. I mean, that's, again, the thing that really lifted my spirit today is just this sense of happiness and what do you guys drink up here anyway? It's, <laughs> it's, really, uh, it's really good, so there you go. Uh, so thank you very much for the chance to share, to share, share this uh, vision. And I'd be happy to take any questions if you'd like. Good. No questions? I'm really happy no, with that. No, 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 uh, can I sneak out now? <laughs> yeah. Sure. Or not. Or not. <laughs> Yeah. So uh, you're right. I mean, it is it is a challenge for us at this point in the history of GIS, which is. Did everybody hear the question? I'll repeat the question so we can continue. The question is, in this world of dynamic GIS where everything's changing, how do you persist the uh, the and curate? long-term, the documentation, when the weather is changing every minute. I mean, you know, we don't store the clouds. I mean, <laughs> we don't store weather events. We sort of do. We can retrace the hurricane, but we don't, we don't synoptically capture traffic. Well, we actually do record traffic in the servers that measure the traffic. Um, what about the views or the mashups? How do we persist those? So that's the logic that finally you get to. Eh, I don't know. I don't have an idea, except <laughs> I really don't. I mean, I'm not joking. Uh, you can roll back the distributed servers that are federated and get a snapshot that way. And I mean, this, this has huge implications in the court system and in, and in historical science. But authenticity, yeah. Yeah. How do you prove that that's what you saw? By rolling back the databases, which are the authoritative source databases, and reconstructing, reconstructing the mashups. That's the only thing that we can do at this point. Are the data providers keeping those versions? You know, that's, a, that's a challenging part. I mean, Damien, you, you have some thoughts? Yeah. Um, this is something we face with a lot of big clients. They make a oil company decides where to drill. They need to be able to depend on where they did that. What they do is they're still archiving the map product that they produce. The visualization. And the documentation of what data was used. Yeah. They are relying on, because their data, they do archive everything back. So they can reconstruct it now that they have the meta information and the visual docs of what they went from what. Those are two approaches. One is to persist the view, or copy or persist or log the view, and that's obviously something you want to do when you spilled oil in the Gulf. The other one is that you roll back, you maintain record keeping, 
pers persist that in your core databases. And when you're bringing mashing up from unreliable sources everywhere on the web, you've got a problem, unless you take the first approach, at least. And you have to document where it came from. That's yeah. What is the role of, for, of curation of the library in this environment? And I mean, I've, we've, librarians played a significant role through the 90s in, in terms of orchestrating, logging, keeping track of geospatial information on the campuses. And, the, um, and that community really grew up with us, helped us a lot. In this age, it's a new age. So do you curate the metadata catalogs? Do you? Uh, well, that certainly, but uh, you know, there's queries. Queries. The point about being able to recreate something dynamically. But I, I right. think there are real policy you know, national policies. There are. For the source, you, you talked about creating these kind of infrastructural data sets that Correct. you eventually need. How do I know that I can trust them? So that gets back to your data policy point. Yes. I'm so glad you're part of this community, really. I mean, it's <laughs> yeah, I, I don't have the answer. I don't want to pretend like I have the answer. I mean, uh, it is going to be a problem that's with us for a long time. But on the other hand, do we stop? No. No, we can't. So we just have to figure out. And I think the secret does lie in these two different tracks. Another question. Yes. Hi. Hi. Yes. Methods. And I'm really interested as you're thinking about things moving more to the platform, issues of accessibility in terms of user experience. I'm thinking about our students and how they sort of get trained up and may not eventually be experts in GIS but can use it functionally. Yes. What, what sort of are the roadmaps for making that accessible and making more people be able to use the system in a variety of contexts? First, on a scale of 1 to 10, if desktop learning is a 10, this platform kind of technology is a half. It's enormously simpler to learn. So you can actually, the hope is that you can actually learn it yourself. Self-service mapping, self-service geoprocessing. Okay, you may want to look at a little video to see, three minute video to see how they do it. But our experience is so far that this is being picked up by students and naive to GIS world people pretty quickly. I mean, the, the, the most remarkable one was Matchell Oil. Again, I keep going back to that, but we're seeing that repeated in, in most of our organizations. Sometimes it's driven by the top by a manager like Governor O'Malley in Maryland or, um, what's that guy's name in Colorado? Um, governor there, he just, he just grabbed it and says, I want to do this, start doing it. And uh, the director of FEMA is the same way. And they just demand simplicity and these apps and and device apps, I mean, you're used to using apps, right? You just start up the app and play with it. So that's what, that's the bar that we hold as necessary for this app world for accessing the platform. But still there's gonna be training because it's not just the technology part, it's also the science behind the technology of how do you interrelate breast cancer with environmental data and not look like a fool. You know, how do you make discoveries between different um, disrelated information and actually have authoritative understanding of it. Um, and that sounds like geography classes or similar sorts of things. I push you back to education is not just learning how to push a button um, or just a high entertainment thrill or just a game. Ga Damien likes to play games. He's playing games all the way up here, Damien, instead of doing your work. But I was thinking, you know, if I could only get him... Uh, <laughs> I had all the insights to you, but the, the, um, if I could only get a GIS game. Look, uh, experiential learning is where it's at, and for me that means working on real problems. So there's a story I'll tell about Detroit students in the 90s used 
the desktop technology to do a project called Get the Lead Out. This teacher in an inner city school introduced them to mapping and he said, okay, what do you guys want to work on? And these five students worked on something called Get the Lead Out. One of the siblings of one of the five kids got lead poisoning and died. Um, these are 15 year old, 15 year old, 16 year old kids. And so the teacher said, well, why don't you measure it? So the kids didn't know anything about the software, but they went to the county health department and they got all these addresses and then they learned how to do geocoding to put the dots on the map. They learned through by doing. Um, so they measured. First they observed a problem, then they measured it. And then the teacher said, well, what do you observe from this? There are certain patterns. So they went to the Census Bureau and got other data. And they found out it correlated with dilapidated housing. And do you know how lead poisoning works? It's a lead paint prior to 1962 was used and uh, in most houses the lead paint was scraped off and latex paint was put on top of it. But for a lot of homes that are dilapidated, poor people living in them, the lead paint falls on the ground, the babies crawl on the floor, eat it and get sick and die. So they found dilapidated housing. Oh, that's the reason. They've made a scientific discovery. Um, then the teacher said, well, what are you going to do about it? And so the kids thought about it and said, let's come up with a plan. Let's get the lead out. And uh, their plan was to hire the high school students to go scrape the lead paint in all the dilapidated houses during the summer. That's a really cool plan. The teacher said, what are you going to do about that? So the kids then got the idea of taking all their maps and all their photographs, going downtown to City Hall and presenting it to the city council and get some money. So they got some money. And the city council got a grant, hired all the high school kids. They got the lead out. So that's a five-step method. Observe a problem, measure it, analyze it, come up with a solution, a geodesign, and then action it. Um, so we took that notion and wrote a book that went into K through 12. And so there's actually thousands of schools that are doing little community-based projects of get the lead out equivalents, cleaning up uh, ditches, you know, replanting forests in Kenya, doing some ag work, and lots and lots and lots of community projects. The trick is that kids did it themselves with just the most minimal coaching, so sort of learn by doing. So um, you know. <laughs> We can make the technology pretty darn simple, and this stuff, like I say, is magnificently simpler. It's not completely ready yet for, for consumers, but it's getting there. And with uh, just a little bit of thinking, kids, I think, will learn it themselves in uh, all sorts of different fields. Thanks. Um, actually, the question is just yeah. Sure. Exactly. Well, you can do it now. It's citizen science is definitely the, the one of the one of the frameworks to be able to do that. But I believe in project-based learning and, and experiential learning in schools. We just don't do enough of that. So giving a little guidance. I mean, you have a lot of it here in the whole ag school, um, and integrating in the garden and other sorts of activities. It's just it's all about that. Uh, but we can amplify that a lot too, and especially in K through 12 schools. Okay, hey. Good afternoon, I'm Nate Roth with the Information Center for the Environment. So using GIS as a platform is almost entirely dependent upon people contributing their data mm -hmm. to the greater, the greater sources of a data set that we have here. How do we convince, we as academic people, we as folks that have influence of various types in the state, local government, within private industry. How do we convince the groups that contributing the, the data is to their advantage and that all the concerns about costs of maintenance, right. liability, and other such are, 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 are worth it? Yeah. The I don't have a solution for you. I mean, you know as much about it as I do. What I will tell you is that this pattern is different. There's something about it that's different, and people within organizations are sharing their data within organizations 
in a way that I never could figure out. Remember that one diagram I said used to be a database can, now it's a web map? Um, our first evidence was last spring with uh, Utah DOT, where all these different stovepipes existed there. And well, you'll have to prove it to me that this GIS thing is worth collaborating around. I'm not going to share my data. The moment they put in the web map pattern, and it just went right to the top, people started using it. Managers, administrators loved it. So they started saying, hmm, how could I? How can I get engaged with you? So the GIS guy who tells this story said everything flipped because it was easy. You didn't actually have to share the raw data. Uh, you just shared a view. And by the way, it's so cool because this sharing environment leverages the investment that I've made and I get something out of it back. So the give-get proposition is no pain, easy to do. I don't actually give up my raw data, but I give up the view thing and I get something really big back. Uh, I mean, right now we are making, this is hard to believe, but we're making 140 million maps a day. And just like right there, I don't know how many maps that was, a hell of a lot though. <laughs> so it's, it's not Facebook, okay, but it's, um, it's Placebook. <laughs> okay, shut up. <laughs> I'm going to shut up, okay. All right, I better stop. Thank you very much. Thanks.